Welcome to Four Speed Ahead. I'm Craig Fuller here with Wolfgang, who is the former head of the Logistics and Transportation Practice at the World Economic Forum. Wolfgang, how are you? I'm great, Craig, and uh, thanks for having me here. Well, excited to get a perspective of someone who's seen a really large scale uh, opportunities, challenges across the global supply chain. Uh, certainly COVID's impact in 2020 has been a significant one, but supply chain and logistics have played really a, a front row seat to not only what's happening, but being uh, responding to these elements and helping everyone respond and recover. What, what has been your observations? My observation is that um, the supply chains um, performed pretty well considering what, what happened to it. Right? We saw critical infrastructure being closed, borders being closed, capacity cut down, 40% of air capacity taking off the market. And still we are uh, able to, to buy a lot of things, uh, uh, surprisingly so. Factories were closed. I, I think everybody is well aware what what happened. And uh, if you see that, um, I, I'm really surprised, and I I'm uh, uh, pretty uh, proud of of the sector what it did. Would you give it a if you were to a grading if you were a professor and you're grading this uh, performance for our industry in supply chain and logistics? Uh, what grade would you give it? Yeah, I would give it a, a pretty high. Maybe we can always do better. Can <laughs> always do better. Uh, and and definitely there were shortcomings, but the supply chain industry is very much a pro problem solving industry, and and I think uh, it adapted very well. So at the beginning, maybe average, and then good, uh, but. Um, excellence remains with with some of the great companies so we're in the b range moving to the a range i, I like that uh, Wolfgang, when you think about the impact of of how supply chains have been res have responded a lot of the at least in the united states a lot of the response has been the private sector has been the logistics companies the third-party logistics providers the large parcel carriers that have played a, a primary role in responding whereas the government has in many ways been dysfunctional. Um, I, I wonder from your perspective, looking at it uh, across uh, the world, how do you think uh, this sort of intersection of private sector and public sector has, inter has, has played out this year? I think it's always a, a difficult intersection. And uh, especially in a crisis situation, um, I think it's, it's brought to the test. I also think that we didn't take the time on the government side to think through what are the alternatives to travel bans, lockdowns, and all that. I, I think that, um, that with more collaboration, more discussion about creative solutions, uh, and this also across borders, we would have been uh, in a better place than we were at, at certain times. So I, I think that um, at the end, um, the, the government's focus on the people and not on the parcels and pallets, because parcels and pallets are not voters, right? So, so that is one of the, the challenges I think we are having with the supply chain. Do you think we'll see governments start to make significant investments in supply chain and really perhaps if we think about a post-Cold War uh, era where, you know, in those days it was a lot of investment in military and military response, it seems like supply chain should get a much more important role in how governments respond to these issues. Do you think that's, that's going to change or are we going to see that the private sector uh, is going to, to predominantly pick up the slack and continue to perform? I uh, tend to believe the latter. So it, it will be private sector led. Uh, there will be some regulatory changes on the horizon to, uh, uh, from, from the government side to uh, uh, fix what they think needs to be fixed. Uh, the famous uh, um, personal protection equipment, 
there will be interventions with the vaccines, which which I expect, which will not be a great thing. Uh, but I, I think that we will see some nationalist uh, on some nationalism, uh, let's say, playing a role in that. But I don't see uh, the, the nationalization of, of supply chains. I see in the recovery program and, and uh, say, support programs, I see potential nationalization of airlines in some countries. But uh, uh, I think that that will be, uh, from my perspective, the lion's share of it. Yeah, I, I know that when we've had hurricanes hit certain states uh, in the United States, places like Florida have built an entire level of inventory and response management, uh, and places like Louisiana just didn't prepare and have sort of paid the price of that. I do hope that there is an awareness of how important having inventory for certain types of items, but also having you know, in, you know a, an intelligent strategy uh, around these elements becomes pretty important. But it, I, I want to talk a little bit about the government response and the amount of stimulus that's been put into the economy. It's certainly driven a lot of the recovery that we've experienced, but it's also driven a ton of demand for freight capacity as all of this money sort of cycles through the economy and consumers buy products. What is your observation of what we've seen in terms of government stimulus and how that impacts freight and supply chains? And what I see is that um, the people are, are not spending as we expected them to spend. So, and, and that would, uh, I think, create a, a pull and, and, and support the, the economies. I, what I see from a global perspective is that those countries that have uh, more social buffers in their system have consumers that are still more active than those who, who are, uh, let's say, less protected. And, um, and both systems have advantages, but that's how I, I see the, currently the, the difference in economies. Um, definitely, we need, more, we need continuous stimulus. I, I think that uh, it is very important, what, whatever the result, that governments continue across the world to keep the engine going. Because I don't think that we are uh, at a stage where we can say, even in countries like China, uh, we are out of the, of the difficult times. So I, I think they're, they're very important and they keep the global economy going, but uh, uh, we have to face that uh, we are in a recession and uh, we have to avoid that, that it's getting worse. Well, it certainly feels like, at least sitting here in mid-October, that you know a second or third wave, depending on your perspective, is hitting. You know, it was, it was quite, it was largely predicted that we would have a, a winter, a COVID winter of sorts that, that was going to come on. I don't think this has surprised many of the uh, folks that you know study the the health data that this would happen. Um, it seems to have surprised the financial markets of late because they're all of a sudden selling off. Uh, I don't know if that's election response or, or just COVID response, but I'm, I'm curious as we sort of move throughout the year and into next year, we have this vaccine, you mentioned it. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation around uh, the, the vaccine supply chain and what that's going to take to provide everyone with uh, enough uh, of, of the black vaccine supply. It's a complicated element because you have uh, things like chain of custody around tracking. You, you have to deal with uh, temperature management and UV management. Do you think that the global logistics and supply chain industry is prepared for a global vaccination? To that question, I can say we are not prepared for this because that's a unique situation. Uh, do I believe that we will be able to distribute vaccines? I think, yes, we will. Uh, for the sim same reasons I mentioned before, uh, the supply chain industry is a problem-solving industry. And when uh, I see the, the amount of activities in this field, a lot of people starting with uh, the big transportation companies, whether it's UPS and the DHL, and and uh, then going to uh, the the new tech companies, which are in the field of 
tracking visibility, et cetera, helping there um, to the consulting companies and international organization. A lot of people are working on that, on that topic. A lot of numbers have to be taken with caution. It is a big challenge, but uh, we have also to see that we will not be able to throw on the market the whole uh, demand uh, volumes at one time. So the, the, the vaccines will come uh, batch by batch. And I think that alone will help to, uh, uh, to manage the situation. Um, I think that there is a bottleneck in, uh, in the health system. Uh, so at the hospitals and, and the doctors, so um, in terms of cold chain, et cetera. So we will see some challenges there. Um, but um, uh, overall, I believe we will manage this. Yeah, it's interesting when we, we, you know, we talk, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, how much capacity is needed for distribu distribution or estimates. Um, it doesn't seem, at least in the United States uh, and, and perhaps Europe, it doesn't seem to be a, a massive capacity constraint uh, because it's going to be a, a surge of volume, but there is enough capacity to absorb it. I, I, I would imagine where we would see a lot of challenges are in places that don't have sophisticated logistics networks, uh, places like Latin America, uh, South America, parts of Africa. Or where, where is your expectation where we'll see the most uh, challenges or the predominance of challenges around vaccination uh, supply chain? I can only, um, uh, let's say, echo what you're saying. The global south will struggle to do this. Uh, lack of infrastructure, lack of connectivity, lack of capacity, lack of communication, network coverage. So all what, what the global north uh, can use is uh, in very limited supply in the global south. And uh, we have enormous numbers of population, very big populations there uh, spread out. Uh, that will be a, a major challenge. And I thank you, Craig, for, for pointing that out. Yeah, I mean, there's gonna be, I mean, I know that there's a, a strong nationalist bent happening a lot of around the world. Uh, certainly you see it in China. You, United States has become very nationalistic. You know, parts of Europe become more nationalistic in the past. It seems like uh, a lot of the countries are sort of taking a stance, at least at the governments, of it's a us versus them in terms of supply. Do, do you do you agree with that, or do you think we're, we're going to see collaboration between governments? I think we will see both. We will uh, see countries that that will. Uh, try to make sure that they can serve their population. And because of uh, uh, a lack of 100% uh, um, visibility, better safe than sorry. And then there are, are nations which are traditionally more cooperative uh, for, for very different reasons. And uh, I, uh, yeah, that's what I see. And I want to add some point on, on the whole vaccine discussion. I think it's important that we just start testing how the system works with lower quantities. And as far as I know, that's also happening. And that's also geared towards global south and uh, less, let's say, equipped countries. Yeah, Freightways had a, an interview with the head of the U.S. military's logistics and supply chain response in charge of vaccinations. Uh, I, I think it was interesting because what, what he pointed out was that they're bringing the private sector into the conversation and into the planning. So McKesson, which is a large hospital uh, and medical distributor here in the United States, is, is leading that response in terms of uh, healthcare supply chain. They have FedEx and UPS in terms of logistics. That actually gave me a lot more comfort than what I was concerned about when, you know, the president's talking about the military doing distribution. I had this sort of thought of Humvees showing up at hospitals, <laughs> a complete mess. But it seems like there is a very rational view and logical view of bringing in private sector uh, supported by government money and uh, intelligence. Yeah, if we just look at what is happening with the e-commerce now because of the situation e-commerce is, is booming and has to do with enormous uh, volumes and searches and, and, and they are coping with it. So I'm, I'm not, not that worried. And uh, 
there is a tradition in the big organizations like military, but also humanitarian organizations to have very close and strong relationships uh, with the private sector. The private sector giving air, air uh, cargo capacity, storage capacity, uh, knowledge capacity, and I, I think we will see a lot of that. Now, Wolfgang, you are doing a lot of, in addition to some of your, your roles that you've got in terms of uh, thought leadership and publishing uh, books and, and talking and consulting, you also sit on a number of boards, both in large uh, corporations as well as very small companies. It seems like in a COVID or post-COVID world, and I don't know if we're really in post, but this sort of transition into a, a different type of economy, that supply chain and logistics startups uh, are getting, have really been announced, have, have done well relative to a lot of the startup community. What is it you're seeing from your global purview uh, different in terms of opportunities that, that may exist out, uh, out there for, for early stage startups? Where I see most traction is in everything visibility and data. And uh, we, we see this also in uh, and the uh, ability to raise capital. Everything what is uh, focused in the space of e-commerce has a significant tailwind. Uh, when it comes to I, the marketplaces, although you see development, if, you come, if we look at uh, self-driving vehicles, I think that's a little bit, bit harder at that moment because it's not the the hot places. We had a lot of discussion about uh, visibility and lack of visibility of uh, supplier, uh, first tier, second tier, uh, and, and to get more, more grip around that. And I, I see clearly the traction there and e-commerce I mentioned. So, so it is a field which uh, either is driven by opportunity like uh, e-commerce or it's driven by the field that uh, uh, we should maybe have done a little bit more and, and have more technology at work to manage such situations better. Are, are you seeing a lot more VC activity investing in logistics startups than what you did before? No, I wouldn't say that. I, I see it more from um, we were, were worried about uh, the, cap the ability to raise capital, and, and we see that it's, that it's possible. So um, I see that the interest is still there and, and the ability is still there. There are other sectors which have much uh, more difficult situations. So uh, whether it's uh, B2B businesses, uh, whether it is what, what's related to the fashion industry, if it's not, uh, let's say the, the tracking side or the customer engagement side. Um, so that's how I look at it. I compare it to uh, what is currently working and, and what is uh, struggling. Now, you've done some seed investing. You like to do seed deals. What, what type of companies are really getting you excited in the market? Yeah, currently I, I'm very excited about uh, everything which is um, visibility. So asset tracking and shipment monitoring. Um, more exciting, excited, but um, maybe it's a bit of ahead of the curve, is the whole uh, supply chain AI. So getting uh, the grip around the data, which, which in fact the visibility providers now generate. And um, yeah, then I have a passion for, for circular economy, uh, which is a, uh, a broader bucket of things. In terms of where we're moving into next year, before COVID, environmental and sustainability was getting a lot of attention across global supply chains. Uh, there was an awareness that companies have responsibilities to look for more efficient supply chains. It seemed to at least for a couple of months be put on hold as sort of this massive surge of volume, protecting uh, health was the priority. Um, in terms of where sustainability is going, what are the, the developments that you expect to sort of happen near term in terms of creating a more sustainable supply chain? Is it collaboration driven by these new visibility systems or is it electric vehicles? Where do you think we'll see a, a lot of the developments happen? 
Yeah, first, I would like to, to define sustainability. For me, it has three dimensions. It's uh, the, the economic dimension, the ecological dimension, and the social dimension. So it's a, it's a more holistic view on, on uh, the business and running the business, not only from a uh, financial perspective. So uh, that's the first. The second, what comes to my mind is uh, that, it, uh, that there are, I see two schools the one school says it's it's on the back burner. The other school says, oh, no, this was a wake-up call, so there will be more. So I de see these two schools. Another element what I see is that it turns out to become a geopolitical component. Uh, if you uh, look at the announcement of China uh, now rivaling with Europe or pacting with Europe, it depends how you see it. Uh, that's also an interesting development. To your question, where where does it come from? Uh, I believe that uh, visibility will give us something. So there will be uh, a nice win-win or coupling of, uh, yes, we do more to manage our supply chain better and, and have more visibility, less disruption, maybe comes with some cost reductions, uh, together with sustainability, at large, so we can reduce fuel, again, cost emissions. Um, we may, may use different routes. I, I see all that. Uh, but I, I think also that has limitations. Um, electrifications in uh, electrification of mobility and transport in urban areas, I see tailwind there, uh, especially when I, when I see uh, where China and, and Europe are going. And uh, then there are big, big challenges in uh, aviation and in uh, ocean freight, where we need, uh, from my perspective, alternative fuels to uh, get any way close to significant breakthroughs. And we saw the IMO 2020 uh, take place, mandate take place earlier this year. There were a lot of predictions of just catastrophic uh, run in oil prices and marine fuel that didn't happen. Uh, it might have been overpredicted, similar to Y2K, but it also could have been COVID really sapped a lot of the demand. It seems like the industry has largely absorbed those uh, additional costs in their business and doesn't seem that there's been a, a significant uh, financial impact uh, related to IMO 2020. Uh, have you seen anything that's, that suggests that uh, they've struggled because of that mandate? No. Uh, I believe that uh, COVID, in that uh, sense, uh, helped the, the industry. It helped it in multiple ways. People were worried that there was not enough uh, capacity to uh, uh, install the, the scrubbers. And uh, there was a problem. There were concerns about, as you say, the fuel prices. Uh, I think that all fell a, fell a kind of apart. <laughs> uh, and... And what uh, also became very clear that compared to the last crisis, major crisis the world has seen um, about 10 years ago, um, the global financial crisis, that uh, now the, the industry has uh, managed that very, very well. And uh, look at the results of the, of the big uh, liners. They, they all look pretty good. So. Um, that has, of course, a flip side in terms of uh, supply chain cost and what does that mean to consumer prices. On the other hand, it shows that uh, there, is, there is clearly a, a lever to uh, absorb cost and, uh, and uh, deal with, uh, with higher, higher investment, higher operating uh, expenses. Okay, I'd like to get your thoughts. You mentioned the airlines have certainly been completely in this Cargo airlines have done well relative to the overall uh, air, air industry. Uh, a lot of the airlines have shifted to cargo to sort of absorb the loss of passenger traffic. What does the world look like in 2022? We get out of this uh, COVID situation. We have a vaccine response, a vaccine availability, therapeutics. What does the world look like when we wake up in 2022 uh, that's going to be different than uh, where it was before? What, what is your expectations of that? That's a very um, challenging question, Greg. Uh, Greg. Um, it, is, it is the crystal ball. I, I think we, you need to see this industry and, and field by field. Um, 
airlines will struggle, e-commerce will, will look great, the home will have a very different function, uh, technology companies uh, will look, look good. Um, so it, it, it is a mixed bag. Um, what uh, I see as well is uh, that China once again uh, uh, got ahead of us all economically mm -hmm. and has more growth. Um, so um, I see there an, an acceleration of, of the, the Chinese advancement in economic leadership, um, at least as a market, what, what will happen on the, on the global landscape, nobody knows. And I think COVID-19 has, has demonstrated um, our life is full of surprises and um, I'm, I just uh, want to stay open uh, for all the, the good things uh, that may come. And um, I'm always hopeful, as I, I pointed out several times, that uh, uh, the global economy, which is in fact uh, a supply chain, uh, will, will manage to absorb a lot of, of shocks which uh, are at the horizon. And, and the hope at the end is that we do in fact uh, put more emphasis, emphasis on um, sustainability. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the supply chain industry, whether it's our business as a, a media and data business, uh, or just broadly, you know, everything from truck drivers to people that are in warehouses, grocery workers, have become the heroes uh, of the COVID economy. And in many ways, I think the COVID impact has elevated supply chain logistics to a C-level function where it seemed like it was sort of trending that way, but a lot of companies were sort of renaissance to actually uh, uh, really own what they were doing with the exception of some of the large big box retailers and e-commerce companies. I, I imagine this is our moment. This is a moment for our industry to really demonstrate the power of supply chain. Um, what are you hearing from executives? Are they optimistic about the future? It depends in which industries they sit. <laughs> if I look at, uh, at the transport industry, if I'm not a, a airline, uh, with a lot of passenger traffic, I, I'm fine. Uh, cargo rates went uh, up. Uh, if I'm an ocean uh, carrier and I make uh, a liner and I make with half of the capacity the same financial results, I'm, I'm happy of that. If I'm uh, uh, in the e-commerce uh, space and had to deal with 20% growth months on months, I'm, I'm happy. When I'm listening to the fashion brands, uh, then uh, there, is, there is a lot of, let's say, unclarity, how to, what do we do with uh, all the, the stock we have? Um, how will the, the year end peak look like? Um, how will consumer behavior change? Uh, so it, it, it depends where, in which, which industry uh, the executives operate. And Wolfgang, a lot of conversation about de-urbanization, leaving the big city centers. We've seen places like New York and San Francisco here in the United States have lost a, a lot of the momentum and, and actually have lost population. I live in a, in a small town uh, in Tennessee, small city, I should say, in Tennessee, where the real estate market is on fire. Home prices have gone up 30 percent since the start of the year in some cases. What are you seeing globally? Is this also the case in Europe? And do you think it's permanent? So Europe, I don't see that much change from that perspective. Um, I see probably a bit more hesitation um, to uh, buy a new house or a new flat, but I also have seen that happening during, during COVID. Um, but this is because of the, of the European system. Uh, Asia, uh, clearly there are, uh, there is drain. Uh, when you look at, at Hong Kong, people leaving for various reasons, but uh, um, the, the economic situation is difficult and, and therefore people struggle to pay the high rents in, in those places. And uh, that leads to a similar situation that some people, some regions gain and, and others lose. Some cities gain, uh, gain others lose. Uh, I, think, I think coming back to your question, what will happen? We will see a lot of shifts. Well, a lot of shifts in uh, 
consumer behavior? Is it is it high end fashion or is it more convenient fashion? Look look at all the the, the webinars and uh, and the Zoom calls, how people are dressed, and compare that with how they were dressed three three years ago or one year ago. It it is a very different picture. So we will see a lot of shifts in the real estate. Uh, we will see in office space. We have a lot of discussion. We will see in, uh, as I said, uh, we will bring much more to our homes. Uh, we brought the shopping centers with e-commerce. We bring doctors now home. We bring schools at home. What what that means? Major shift, um, and and not without concerns. Um, so that's what I what I expect. And and some shifts will be for the better if uh, big cities get a little bit less pressure to absorb all the influx of people that's a good thing yeah i completely agree i i think once we get through the health crisis uh, there's actually been a lot of benefits to a sort of restructuring of how society works at least in a modern economy i, I certainly benefited from it uh, being you know, having more time with my family, my young children, getting to spend time with them, as you mentioned, not having to worry about what you're wearing, at least, at least uh, top up, right? You gotta, you, you gotta at least wear something. So, you, you know, uh, you, you, not buying pants, maybe. Uh, uh, we have a desk here at Freight Waves where you can't see anything below. So I'm wearing jeans, but uh, I know some people wear shorts and you will never know that, so. Uh, but anyways, Wolfgang, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate you coming in. It's a fascinating conversation about what life looks like uh, today and in the future. Uh, really uh, incredible insights about uh, what you're seeing on a global basis. It's certainly a, a story that's going to play out uh, for many, many decades. So Wolfgang, thanks for coming on for, uh, Polar Speed Ahead today. Thank you for inviting me.